This is my top 10 of 2010 video. Yay! Yay! Adam, why does it take you over a year to make your top 10 list? No, it doesn't. It just takes me that long to actually watch all the movies. There's quite a few movies on this list that would have been impossible for me to see had I actually wanted to make my top 10 at the end of the year. And remember, this is my fucking list, so I don't want to hear any, ah, this movie was so good, how come it wasn't on it? Because uh, I know there will be a few of those. And that doesn't mean there was anything wrong with the movie, it just means I didn't like it as much as you did. But you're bound to find at least one movie on this list that you like, hopefully one you've never heard of before. Maybe you'll like it enough to buy it. On DVD, it's a movie on a disc the size of a CD. The picture is twice as sharp as VHS. The sound is infinitely clearer. It looks and sounds like you're at the movies, but you can experience it at home. At number 17, we have Tucker and Dale vs. Evil. It's a parody movie of cheesy slasher flicks. So although the movie's pretty cheesy and campy, so are the movies that it's making fun of. It's gory, hilarious, and who doesn't love making fun of rednecks? Grab your buddies, smoke something, and then watch it, because it's awesome. Definitely worth mentioning on this list. You gotta have some faith in yourself, man. Girls can smell fear. Now come on, you are a good-looking man. More or less. You got a damn good heart. Nope. Yep. I mean, that's two things right there. Now go on, get over there. What, what's the worst that can happen? You know something? You're right, Tuck. I'm gonna do it. All right. I'm gonna do it right now. All right, hold up, hold up, hold up. All right, no. W whatever you say, just smile and laugh. That shows confidence. Smile and laugh. Okay. Do it. All right. You guys, uh, going camping? <laughs> At number 16 is I Saw the Devil, another awesome movie from South Korea with Min Sik Choi from Old Boy. It's action-packed and disturbing, and although a lot of the characters seem to be really good at surviving blunt force trauma to the head, it still had great camera work, a great score, great performances, and was successfully emotional where it needed to be. If you love fucked up and violent emotional revenge stories, then this movie's for you. Definitely worth watching. At number 15 on my list is Catfish, a movie that cannot properly be marketed without the whole thing being spoiled. So if you watch the trailer for this and then you get upset thinking that it's something different than it actually was, then go fuck yourself. It's a documentary about finding a relationship online. However, there's a few twists and turns when they start to find out that this person is not who they claim to be. Now there's a lot of people on the internet screaming, fake, this whole thing is fake. And here's what I have to say about this. You weren't there, neither was I. I wouldn't be surprised if it was fake or true, but so far every single piece of so-called evidence that I've seen against this film's legitimacy has been complete bullshit. Just enjoy the story being told. It's a great character study. How come that one scene, the postcard wasn't returned to the sender's address? Uh, cause a lot of postcards don't have a spot for return address. Well then how come that one scene, that guy didn't have a microphone, but they all had a microphone, but you could hear that other guy really clearly. Well, it all depends on how you set the levels on your fucking microphone. He didn't sound mic'd. And do you think the filmmakers would be stupid enough to actually mic a guy that they said isn't mic'd? Well, doesn't this story seem a little bit coincidental? Yes, but probability states that if there are millions of people making documentaries, eventually you're gonna catch something interesting on camera. I'm inclined to believe that the filmmakers had an idea of what they were getting into before they decided to make a movie out of it, but that doesn't mean the whole thing was fake and didn't happen. In this scene from Bowling for Columbine, you see Michael Moore say some words to Charlton Heston as he walks away, but as you can see, there's no camera there, but that doesn't mean that he didn't say those words. For documentaries, you don't always have cameras rolling everywhere and you have to recreate small details. Just like the close-ups of the screen in Catfish were done in post-production. You'd be surprised at how many documentaries do this, but that doesn't mean they're fake. And again, I'm not saying this movie is undoubtedly true, but if you're calling it fake, then it's just as much of a hunch as someone calling it legitimate, so just enjoy the fucking movie. I can't believe I wrote this. I can't wait to fill my fingers with your hair and turn your back to me, pulling you up against me and running my tongue all the way up your neck, biting your ears as I fill my hands with your breasts. <laughs> I 
sounds like a bad porno book, doesn't it? But let's not get ahead of ourselves. Taking it slow, though difficult, will be very important for us if this is really going to happen. Wait, is this still you? Me. Megan, I want you so badly, my body aches for you. Neve, 15 days and I'm all yours. Megan, I don't understand the hold you have on my heart. There isn't anything I wouldn't do for you, babe. Neve, I'm gonna hold you to that. Get some sleep, big day tomorrow. Happy fourth, yay freedom. <laughs> dreams of me. I'll be dreaming of you. I adore you. Neve. Good night, sugar. At number 14 on my list is Howl. This artsy film tells the story of the poetry behind Allen Ginsberg, played by James Franco. This movie highlights ideas of self-image, discrimination, and ultimately censorship, where it shows a trial in which people try to censor his works based on his uncompromising foul language. It's got a great score, it's original, and it makes you think. Definitely worth checking out. And other times, I, I do know what makes complete sense, and I start crying. Because I realize that I'm, I'm hitting on an area that's absolutely true. In that sense, uh, able to be read by someone and wept to, maybe centuries later. In that sense, uh, prophecy. Because it touches a common key. I mean, what prophecy actually is, is not knowing whether uh, the bomb will fall in 1942. It's knowing and feeling something which someone knows and feels in a hundred years. And maybe articulating it in a hint that they will uh, pick up on in a hundred years. And number 13 is Too Everything, Too Terrible, Too Tokyo Drift. This is the second movie from Everything is Terrible, and it's my favorite one, too. They take old VHS tapes and edit them into a long montage of what the fuck. It's basically a giant movie making fun of the 80s and 90s. A compilation of instructional videotapes and religious propaganda edited in such a way that makes it hilarious. Jesus wanted me to give you this. These are the same people that are responsible for the popularity of Cat Massage Lady and Dwayne. Dwayne, I was wondering, what fashion trends do you follow? Well, I usually look in magazines or um, see what the kids at school are wearing. Dwayne! <laughs> Janet! This is the perfect movie to watch with your buddies because it'll have you in stitches. Check it out. Yo, Daddy, I'll suck your big black dick for $2. Number 12 is The King's Speech. The Oscar winner that managed to come home with Best Picture, Best Original Screenplay, Best Directing, and Best Male Performance by Colin Firth. It's well shot, it's funny, it's emotional, and you guys already know everything about it. I won the fucking Oscar. And although Colin Firth should have gotten the Oscar the year before for a single man, this one was definitely well deserved. Plans for the coronation. I think that would be an even bigger mistake. <laughs> I'm not a king. <laughs> I'm a naval officer, that's all I know. <laughs> I'm not a kick, I'm not a kick. I'm sorry. No. I'm sorry. Number 11 is Armadillo, a Danish documentary about Danish soldiers in Afghanistan. The filmmakers do away with the cliche sit in a chair and talk to the camera war type documentary. They film the events as almost omniscient observers. And five minutes through the film, I forgot I was even watching a documentary. This is about as real as a war documentary gets. Definitely check this one out. Number 10 on my list is Inception. 
Although I feel this movie is grossly overrated, I enjoyed it a lot. It's definitely not a flawless movie, and I wouldn't call it genius, but it does make you think. Even if there are some inconsistencies in the world they've created, it sure is an interesting world to watch. And you can't really ignore the directing expertise from Christopher Nolan, and same goes for the classic score from Hans Zimmer. The ominous theme mimics that of a slowed-down version of the song that they use to wake up from the kicks. And considering this movie explains that time slows down for each level the dream, I'd say that's fucking genius. Search up Inception Music Comparison on YouTube and you'll see a great video explaining why. And before I get people going, ah, oh, what problems could you possibly have with Inception? I'm gonna explain it right now. In the film, they establish Limbo as virtually a place of no return. If you go there, it's basically like suicide. So, now we're trapped in Fisher's mind battling his own private army, and if we get killed, we'll be lost in Limbo till our brains turn to scrambled egg. But then later when they actually go to Limbo, they're just like, peace, and jump off. Apparently all you need is a suicide and a defibrillator and your gunshot wound is cured. Maybe I'm wrong about this and someone can explain it to me. Maybe it had something to do with the kicks. Or maybe the amount of time they had left. But then there's this scene where Leo's like, oh no, I'm stuck, and I'm just like, turn your fucking body. It's not really a flaw, it's just the way they shot it. It pisses me off. Look at his shoulders, just fucking turn. And then there's this scene where Maul kills herself, and it basically sets off the plot of the whole movie before it even starts. She basically frames him for murder, but she's in a different hotel room altogether. Possibly even a different hotel chain. So how does this frame him for murder? Wouldn't they have records of her checking out two different hotel rooms? Wouldn't they at least have some security camera footage of her at the desk? I don't know why Leo had to run away from all this. It seems like a pretty clear-cut case to me. They wouldn't have any of his shoe or fingerprints in the other room at all. And she trashed the room that he was in to make it seem like he threw her from there. But a forensics team can't figure it out? He'd have to throw her pretty far for that to be possible. And that doesn't explain why two rooms would be checked out. I'm open to conversation about this so someone can explain it to me, but I really don't get it. She had herself declared sane by three different psychiatrists. It made it impossible for me to try to explain the nature of her madness. That seems a little fishy too. If she was declared sane by the first, why would she go to the second? And then the third. That right there tells anyone she doubted her own sanity. And if she didn't, then it makes it obvious she was trying to set him up, right? Okay, okay, maybe this one's not so much a flaw either. Men often lose court cases to their wives. But everyone remembers the formula they set up for the time changes in the dreams, right? In a dream, your mind functions more quickly, therefore, time seems to feel more slow. Five minutes in the real world gives you an hour in the dream. So by that logic, you go down a level and five seconds turns into a minute. So how long do you think it takes a van to fall off a bridge at normal speed? What, like six seconds? Let's use this guy as a reference. That took like three seconds. Don't worry, I'm getting to my point. Let's be overwhelmingly generous and say the van took 10 whole seconds to fall off that bridge. That means that Joseph Gordon-Levitt has two minutes to kill a guy, find out how to give people a kick in zero gravity, tie them up, move them into the elevator, rig up explosives, and set them off. And there's no way that he did that in two minutes. I've had this argument with people before and nobody believed me, but now I can actually prove my point. Even if the van somehow took 20 seconds to fall, he wouldn't have made it. I present to you the entirety of the clips of Joseph Gordon-Levitt taking place during the van's fall. And I'm gonna leave that right fucking here so you can see how long it is while I keep doing my review, bitch. Does this mean the movie's bad? No, not at all. I think it's great. With an idea that complicated, you're bound to find some inconsistencies. Even if it's not genius, it does make you think. Just look at all the arguments about the end Ending. Speaking of which, here's my take on it. You see the top spinning. You see it wobble. That's it. It never wobbled before when he was in a dream. It never lost momentum at all. It just spun fluidly. If the ending was a dream, then it would contradict the other times he was in a dream. The only way for that to make sense would be if the whole thing was a dream. And if the whole thing's a dream, then what the fuck is the point of saying the whole thing's a dream? Why can't you just say the plot of Death Race 2 is a dream? That'd actually make more sense. Number nine is Dogtooth, a Greek film about some master trolls. You learn that these parents have kept their children sheltered from society for their entire lives, living only on their property and teaching them that it's dangerous to go outside their fence. And it really raises some questions about rights you have with your children, because you have a lot of rights. As it is right now, you're allowed to teach your kids that who they love will determine whether or not they spend an eternity in a pit of fire and snakes. You can teach them that we spawned up from dirt, and you're perfectly allowed to do that. You can teach them that earthquakes are caused by sex before marriage, and you're allowed to do that. Anyway, this movie's perfectly fucked up enough for me to enjoy, and I had a lot of fun watching it. I have a new anesthetico. Do you want to try it? Yes. Όποια ξυπνήσει πρώτη κερδίζει. Εντάξει. Μη μου βάζει περισσότερο. Ένα, δύο, τρία.
And number eight is 127 Hours. This is just the level of quality of a film that I've come to expect from Danny Boyle. James Franco delivers another fantastic performance. And for the love of God, if you haven't seen this movie, don't search up anything about it. I was on the message boards on IMDb and they spoiled the whole thing before it was even released. It's based on a true story and everybody assumes that you already heard of that true story, which I didn't. But regardless, it's still a great movie that pays attention to details of the actual events. They even use the same camera that was used. Watch this movie if you haven't already. And number seven is Beautiful, from the director of Babel, 21 Grams, and Amores Peros. I don't know if I'm pronouncing any of that right. This movie shows the Academy Award-nominated performance of Javier Bardem, playing a man with prostate cancer trying to help everyone around him before he dies. This movie is depressing as fuck, but this director is really good at that. It has some of the best sound editing I've seen all year, and once again, his movie has a really original soundtrack. If you like feeling like shit like I do, then check it out. Déjalo. Te has vuelto loco, déjalo, por favor. Por el amor de Dios, vete, vete de aquí, vete, ya vete, vete, déjamelo, déjamelo. Por favor. Suelta a Mateo, suelta a Mateo, suelta a Mateo, Marambra. No puedo. Suéltalo, joder. Suéltalo, suéltalo. If you haven't noticed, Joseph Gordon-Levitt finally finished his shit, and that only took like four minutes. Okay, I'll shut up. At number six is Exit Through the Gift Shop, a documentary from the legendary street artist known as Banksy. This movie tells the story of how street art exploded onto the scene, and the sequence of events is just so fucking hilarious, it's awesome. It's not so much a documentary about Banksy, but about the movement itself. And it also highlights a really interesting character study of one of the newest members of the movement. This is definitely one of the funniest movies of the year, and I had a blast watching it. Terry's cousin was Space Invader, a major player in an explosive new movement that would become known as street art. This hybrid form of graffiti was driven by a new generation using stickers, stencils, posters, and sculptures to make their mark by any means necessary. With the arrival of the internet, these once temporary works could be shared by an audience of millions. Street art was poised to become the biggest countercultural movement since punk. And Terry had landed right in the middle of it. And number five is Ensembles. My accent fucking sucks. This powerful film tells the story of twin brother and sister as they attempt to unravel the mystery of their mother's life. It's from the acclaimed Canadian director of Polytechnique. It's so emotional and uncompromising that some of the scenes are downright shocking. I'll definitely be keeping my eye on this director from now on. Mama. 
Number four is Enter the Void. This is definitely one of the most original movies I've ever seen. The entire movie is like one giant trip. You experience the world through the eyes of a drug dealer who gets killed. And after he dies, you wander the earth as his soul, watching the drama unfold between the characters whose lives were affected by this tragedy. It also has one of the best opening credits of any movie ever. This is a must see. That's what you came here to say? That you're sorry? Yes. Really? Yes. Why don't you go make yourself useful and go kill yourself? Why don't you go make yourself useful and fucking go kill yourself? You don't, you don't mean that. I do. Like you don't understand that. I mean, it, it, it's partly my fault, but it's not. For me it's and not Oscar, old. go fucking kill yourself. No, you have to understand this. Piece it. of shit! No, but Oscar started dealing drugs because, because, because you, you were with all these sleazy people. Because it's me! Three is Roman Polanski's The Ghost Writer. This meticulously directed political thriller stars Ewan McGregor as the ghost writer for the British Prime Minister. Shit goes down and he realizes he's way over his head as more secrets begin to surface. It's an amazingly shot movie and I really love the consistency that he kept with the weather, which is almost a character itself. Go see it. Number two is I Am Love, starring Tilda Swinton. She's perfect for the lead in this movie, and she actually learned Russian and Italian for her role, neither of which she spoke beforehand. The director really emphasized on size, which is present in its titles, its scenery, and even its musical composition. The final scene of the film brought me a feeling that I've never actually felt before in a movie. And there's a lot of details to appreciate about this movie, and Cartina Richardson does a great job explaining them. It is through costume that Guadagino most clearly asserts the film's largeness. It's aspiration to timelessness. All characters were elegant but simple clothes, ones that prevent them from being identified with any particular time period. Belonging to one year is small. Belonging to all years is large. The film's costumes also display Guadagino's careful use of color, which frequently underlines connections between characters. Emma has a special relationship with her daughter Beta, and in several scenes the two wear colors previously worn by the other. Here Beta wears tan while her mother wears burgundy, and in the previous scene here Emma wears tan while in the next room Beta wears burgundy. Now Emma's son has a close relationship with Ida the housekeeper, and look, see how the orange juice she pours matches his shirt? Even the leaves on the plant are the precise shade of green to complement the walls and the furniture. It's expertly crafted and it's different, so I wouldn't recommend it to everybody, but I sure as hell enjoyed it.
Buonasera, signore. And my favorite movie of 2010 is... Black Swan. Everything about this movie is fantastic. The score by Clint Mansell, the choreography, Natalie Portman's performance. Darren Aronofsky put a lot of effort into directing this one. The way the camera works around the mirrors without being seen, the artistically placed shots, just being a fucking genius with mirrors in general. All of the casting was great in this movie, especially for Mila Kunis's character. She's perfect to play the carefree, naughty girl in this movie. This movie does a great job showing the pressure and drama in these dance groups once you hit a certain age. Other than that, I just love trippy movies where the character descends into madness. I'm sure you guys have already seen it, but if you haven't, I'd strongly recommend it. My daughter, the Swan Queen. <laughs> It's our favorite. Vanilla with strawberry filling. Oh, Mom, not too big. Oh, that's way, way too much. Oh, it's a celebration. It's just this once. Mom, my stomach's still in knots. Fine. Fine. Then it's garbage. No, Mom, don't. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm just... I'm just so proud of you. You look so yummy. Now you can complain about it in the comments section, you asshole. I know there's at least one movie on this list that you haven't seen, so start your tor- I mean, go to Blockbust- Fuck.